Good day and welcome back to Chemistry Videos with me, Clarissa Sorensen Unruh. I am going to talk about stoichiometry today and it's very exciting. So I have this massive problem here on the glass that is extremely interesting, I think. It's about ascorbic acid and it's going to take us through some steps that you can definitely do for several different types of problems, especially when you're dealing with stoichiometry. So what we have here is we're going to do the first we're going to do a series of videos. The first video, which is this one, the one we're in right now, is going to be um, the first part. So we're going to do number one in the first video, and then we're going to add on to number two in the second video, and then we'll add on to number three in the third video. And the last video, bless it, we'll have um, something that I did, couldn't fit on the board. So we'll have to erase them. It'll be great. OK, all right, let's start with the first part. So we read this. And really, the first thing that pops out at me is that we have percentages of elements in a compound. That is incredibly important to recognize. Um, and the reason why it's incredibly important to recognize is because when you have this particular setup, you're almost always going to be calculating an empirical or molecular formula, at least in the general chemistry sense. Um, and the reason why that's particularly interesting is that these percentages don't just pop out of the ground like, you know, grass or something, they are, um, or daisies, <laughs> they are actually obtained from a mass spectrometer. So a mass spectrometer will often give us, a GCMS is often the way we use mass spectrometers. So we use uh, GC means gas chromatography. So basically we put a liquid in or uh, a solid, we force it into the gas phase, throw it down some giant tube, um, a giant tube meaning not like diameter giant but long and it separates out um, the components of that particular element I mean not element sorry that particular compound into its constituent elements so that we can get a sense of what's going on in terms of each of the elements in that particular substance that is awesome because those kinds of percentages are often what we get so we want to use that information so again not just made up we don't just make this stuff up. It actually comes from an instrument. All right, so in terms of ascorbic acid, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out what the missing piece of information is here. So indeed, if the rest is oxygen, we need to figure out what that rest is, right? Um, in terms of this, we know that if there are only three elements in that particular compound, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, the sum of their percentages has to be 100%. So what I can do here to find oxygen is I can add these two together and then subtract it from 100%. Let's do that first. So first, fill in the missing info. The missing information. What am I missing here? I'm missing oxygen. So to find oxygen, I'm just going to take 100%. Oh, my green marker is going. And I'm going to subtract out 40% plus 4.59%, right? And that's going to give me some piece of information, which is stellar. Let me figure out what that is. I got my handy dandy calculator right here. All right, 55.41. Isn't that a lovely marker? Look at that. So that's the amount of oxygen. Then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to relabel the percents as grams. And when we relabel the percents as grams, all we're going to do is we're going to say, instead of 40%, we're going to have 40 grams of carbon. Instead of 4.59% of hydrogen, we're going to have 4.59 grams of hydrogen. And 55.41 grams of oxygen. OK, why do we do this? The reason why is because we're saying, basically, if we had a pile of 100 grams of this compound, then 40 grams of that would be carbon, and so on and so forth. Okay. Then the next piece we're going to do is we're going to convert these into moles. We know that if we had a formula, any formula we have, um, those subscripts in the formula can be either in atoms per molecule of that formula if you're talking about molecules, that is, covalently bonded things, which we are here because this is C's, H's, and O's, which is an organic compound. Um, and if you look at that again, so let me 
bring this out a little bit. Let's say we had this, right? What I'm saying here is if I had one molecule of glucose here, or monosaccharide, whatever that looks like, um, then I have six atoms of C, 12 atoms of H, and six atoms of O, right? We could also say that if I had a mole of this molecule, right, if I had a mole of that particular molecule of glucose, then I would have six moles of carbon atoms in the midst of that, I would have 12 moles of hydrogen atoms in the midst of that, and six moles of oxygen atoms in the midst of that. So that's very important to recognize because the first thing we're going to do here with these grams is we're going to convert to moles. How do we do that? We need a molar mass. So we're going to relabel the percents as grams. Ooh, I'm going to add an and, and convert to moles. Using molar mass. Woohoo! Molar mass is very important. We know that we can get the molar masses off the periodic table. Here I go. 12 grams of carbon for one mole of carbon. 1.01 .01 grams of hydrogen for one mole of hydrogen. And 16 grams of oxygen for one mole of oxygen. Where in the world did I find those numbers? I found them underneath the C and the H and the O on the periodic table. Now, I just happen to have those memorized. So, you know, if you happen to have them memorized, then you don't have to look on a periodic table. Lucky for us, I didn't have to look at a periodic table. But you should <laughs> until you have them memorized. All right, so let's go ahead and calculate these out. 40 divided by 12.01 is going to give me 3.33, nice, 3.33 3, 3, 3, 3 moles of carbon here, 4.59 divided by 1.01, 4.54 moles of H here, and then 55.41 divided by 16. 3.46, I'm going to lay, I'm going to make that 3.5 moles of O. Well, isn't this interesting? <laughs> Usually, if you have a pretty easy moment, as soon as you um, look at these moles, you start to get some interesting things going on. First off, recognize that these numbers that I just calculated in pink are not whole numbers, <laughs> and you do not generally see formulas that have something like C 3.33, age 4.54, O 3.5. That's not the way that formulas come, right? They don't have decimal points. We need whole numbers. So the first thing we're going to do, everything we do from here on out is simply to get these numbers into whole numbers. That's all we're doing. Okay. The two processes we use to get these into whole numbers is we divide all the numbers by the smallest number and we also then, um, so first thing, divide all the numbers by the smallest number and then you can uh, multiply by a whole number to get rid of any de remaining decimals. All right, so let's divide all the numbers by the smallest number first. Smallest number here is 3.33. Oh, this is going to be interesting. Let's hope this turns out to be something. All right, so 3.33. This becomes 1.03 or 0 0.04 moles of oxygen. This should become one for real, right? One mole of carbon because any number divided by itself is one. And then let's see what happens with this lovely middle one. This becomes 1.36, which is kind of what I expected. 1.36 moles of H. Okay. Now, the trick here is that 1.04, if it's 0, 0.0 something, you can round. If it's not 0, 0 something, you can't round. So here, this one is fine. One, 
This one is fine. One. This one, not fine. <laughs> we have to do something else with that. So at this point, let's erase a little bit of what I got going here so that I can have a little bit of extra space to get my work done. Woo! Erasing. Yeah. I like circles. They make me happy. At least when I'm erasing glass. <laughs> All right. The mandatory erasing moment. <laughs> and now we take a moment to erase. There you go. We're done. All right, so now what I need to do is I need to get rid of this 1.36 moles of H. And I'm going to do that by multiplying all three of these by some whole number to resolve that. So I have one mole of carbon. I have 1.36 moles of hydrogen and 1.04 moles of oxygen. At this point, this is awesome. We love this. But the problem becomes that I need to get rid of this 0.36. And the way I think about it is I think about it in terms of money. Because I was a super greedy child. And the nice thing about American money, at least, is that it, 100 pennies are in a dollar. So you can figure out, gosh, if it's 0.36, how many piles of 0.36 or something close to 0.36 would I need of pennies to get something like a dollar? And that would be three piles, right? So it's like 0.33 or something close to that. So if I multiplied all three of these by three, I should resolve this 0.36 enough to be able to do something with it, to get it into a 0, 0.0 something. So this is three moles of carbon, three moles of oxygen, and that times three is 4.09. We're going to call that good enough, four moles of hydrogen. And so these whole numbers that I finally found that took me forever to find are in my empirical formula subscripts. So I know in my empirical formula I have three C's, four H's, and three O's. Okay? Now that's that would be awesome to be done. <laughs> That would be really great to be done. But we aren't done. Of course we're not done. Why would be, we be done that quickly? <laughs> All right, so what do we need to do? We need to figure out what the molecular formula is, right? So really what we're going for is the molecular formula. And why did I go about, it, about doing this this way? Because there are actually several ways that you can ca calculate an empirical formula. The reason why I went about this way is because it always works for everything. Okay, so in terms of looking at other kinds of formulas, it may work for other kinds of formulas, but often with, it may work for, other ways may work for every kind of formula you get. But usually in ionic compounds, our formula does not show, it's not exactly the same thing as molecular compounds. Right? So with molecular compounds, we've talked about before that the, when we have a formula, that shows how the units in which that particular substance comes. So when I have something like H2O, I can be pretty much guaranteed that in the midst of having a whole bunch of water, every time I see it, it will come in packets of one O bonded to two H's in terms of atoms, okay? That is not how an ionic compound comes. An ionic compound comes more like the scaffolding of a building. So when we write NaCl, that's not how that comes. That's just a relative ratio, the simplest ratio, an empirical formula perhaps, of how, uh, of the ratio of the ions to one another in the midst of this scaffolding. So every time I have one Na, I will have one CL as well. That's a different kind of moment. That's not the way it comes. It actually comes as big crystalline solids um, or big crystalline somethings, okay? Um, not necessarily exactly the same thing. All right, having said that, I need to find the molecular formula for this. So that's why I taught you the way that I taught you. 
in terms of the molecular formula. The reason why I did that is because um, to find the empirical formula first should work on all the way we just found it, should work on all ionic compounds and covalent compounds if you go through this process. If you're doing ionic compounds, you may or may not be given this piece of information. And the other way to calculate molecular formulas directly usually utilizes this piece of information in the midst. Just FYI, pick your poison, use it a whole bunch of times in terms of what you want to use to calculate things, and then use it a whole bunch of times. But this is the way I'm going to go. All right, so molecular formula. Uh, molecular formula, the thing that's interesting here is that an empirical formula shows the simplest ratio of those elements to one another in the formula. In terms of molecular formulas or molecular, um, really we call them molecular formulas. Sometimes we call them other things, but molecular formulas is pretty good. We are going to use this particular um, molar mass or molecular weight, and we're going to use that as a ratio to the empirical formula's molar mass. And we're going to find a multiplier, and then I'll show you what we're going to do with that multiplier. So let's use this lovely uh, molar mass or molecular weight that I was given. I'm even going to do a pointing moment towards it. And then I'm going to divide that by the molar mass of the empirical formula I just calculated. And we know how to calculate this. You just look up C on the periodic table, the atomic weight or atomic mass or the number underneath the C on the periodic table. And you multiply it by the number of each element you have. So you're going to multiply it by the subscript. So if this is C, this is the number underneath C, this is how many C's I have. For H's, this is the number underneath H. This is the number of H's I have. For O's, this is the number underneath O on the periodic table. And this is the number of O's I have. Right? And I'm going to calculate that out very quickly here. Bam. I got 88. Point uh, zero seven grams per mole. All right, those two cancel out, and if I take this one seventy six point one four divided by eighty eight point zero seven, I get a two. Now, what am I going to do with this two? Okay, so I took what was given over what I calculated for the empirical formula. This 2 now becomes my multiplier. The multiplier is what I multiply all the subscripts in the empirical formula by in order to get the molecular formula. So in terms of the molecular formula, let's just go ahead and put it right here because there it is. I'm going to have 3 times 2 C's. I'm going to have 4 times 2 H's. And I'm going to have 3 times 2 O's. My molecular formula becomes C6H8O6, which is indeed the molecular formula of ascorbic acid. Okay, what's interesting here is that the multiplier is very important. The only difference between a molecular formula, what we actually see in nature the vast majority of the time, and an empirical formula, which is the sim simplest ratio of the numbers to one another, and which we may or may not see in nature on a regular basis, is this multiplier. Right? I just take this, the, the combination between these two, or what is the relationship between these two, is just that all of these numbers have been multiplied by something to get these. And so this multiplier becomes an important piece. Okay? Until next time, we'll bid you adieu and wish you a wonderful time. All right. Bye.